Good morning, church. How you guys doing today? You guys are much more lively than our first service. I asked that question and one person responded. So good to see you guys. Good to be with you guys. Those who are watching online, good to have you with us. Those in the commons area, my peeps, also welcome. Today I want to look at a spiritual principle that has immense power for our spiritual lives if we practice it. But it is really hard to do that in the world that we live in. Now, we've been looking through Acts 2, journeying through Acts 2, the early church, and watching them and learning how they have positioned themselves to receive the Holy Spirit, and then how the Holy Spirit has moved powerfully through them and through the communities. We'll get to that in just a moment. You could say this spiritual principle can take people to a much deeper spiritual walk. It empowers us to walk in freedom, to not be controlled by the circumstances of our life, to not be tossed back and forth by the instability of our economy or a world that is on fire. But if we can practice this, we can position ourselves to walk in freedom, to walk with a godly confidence that no matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens to us, we stand on the rock. We stand on who Christ says he is, that he has overcome the world. And this is the principle that I want to share with you guys that can transform our lives. You don't own anything. Amen. That's, a fact. That's it. You can say amen, it's okay. You don't own anything. God does, and he gives it to us as a gift to manage. It is not ours, it is God's. And there are so many scriptures that echo this principle, but I want to share this one in Psalm, Psalm 118. And it says this, today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I love this scripture. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a great reminder of the gift we have of today. That God gives us life. He gives us this day as a gift to us, as a good father. And no matter what we are going through, no matter our, our circumstances in life, we can still rejoice and be glad in it because he is in control. He is in charge. And there is that spiritual principle embedded in this verse throughout scripture. Who made this day? Not you, not me. The Lord made this day. He made this day as a gift to us. And everything in the day he owns. You know, God is the creator of the universe, which means that everything else is created. Everything else is created. He is in charge of it all. He gives it to us as a gift to manage. But God also gives us free will. He gives you this day as a gift, and you can choose to do with it whatever you please. He doesn't force you to do it the way he wants you to do it. He gives it to you. So you can be glad and rejoice in it today or not. But out of God's great love for us, his desire to give all that he has to us, he gives us this day. Not only the day that he owns, he owns everything in it. All your gifts, all your abilities, all your talents, all your skill sets, those are gifts from God. You know, I gave my, uh, I gave my two boys a, a cell phone as a gift years ago, and I don't, I'm not sure when the right time to give a kid a cell phone is. I have no idea. I'm sure I failed at that as a parent. But I gave them a cell phone. I wrapped it all up, and I gave it to them. And they open up the cell phone and like, oh, dad, thank you so much for giving us a cell phone. I got my cell phone. I go, you're welcome. But I want you to know, I want you to know that is your phone, but not really. That's your phone, but not really. Actually, I'm giving you my phone for you to manage. It's not yours. The content that you use, how you communicate, it's your responsibility but it's still my phone. And don't you dare put a passcode on there that I don't know. 
You change the passcode, and I will change the course of your life. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm big and bad. I'm tough. But, Dad, it's mine. No, it's yours to manage. This is a spiritual principle in Scripture. God gives it to us. The word to manage. The word stewardship means to actually, you don't own anything, but you're taking care of what's been given to you. It's not ours. It's God's to take care of. Every gift you have received, every ability. You're good at business. You're good at making money. Wonderful. It's a gift from God. You're good with numbers. You're good at teaching. It is a gift from God. You're athletic. It's a gift from God. You have a high IQ. I wish I had a high IQ. I've tried to have a high IQ. I keep losing IQ points the older I get. It's not your own doing. It's a gift from God. Everything you have, the house, car, the gifts you have is a gift. Whenever my wife gives me a gift, I thank God for the gift. And now he's given my wife the ability and actually the desire to want to do that for me. It's not ours. It's God's. It's not ours. It's God. And I want to tell you something. It's really hard. It's hard for me because I want to hold on to it. It's mine. Anytime my boy asks me for money, I'm like, hmm, it's not yours. It's mine. It's hard. But we were never meant to get these gifts and make them our own, to be possessive with them. God gives us gifts to enjoy, for pleasure, to share with one another, to grow his kingdom. That's what he desires we do with his gifts. But again, God gives us the free will. You can choose to do with your gift whatever you choose to do. Nothing is ours. We own nothing. This is not meant to be harsh, church. This is actually to be freeing. This is to help you walk in freedom. When we have the perspective that it is not ours, but God's, it can be a game changer for our spiritual lives. When we have this perspective, it can transform our hearts in our lives. It can transform how we see our stuff, our money, our health, our relationships, everything. We're not bound to it anymore. It's God's to give and God's to take. And we can walk in freedom and trust in who he says he is. And when we do this, we position ourselves to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to me, I want you to stay with me. I promise you this is not a sermon on money, okay? I promise you that it's not about money. Stay with me, I'm not gonna do a bait and switch at the end of the sermon and get in them jeans and grab them greens, okay? <laughs> Who actually carries cash anymore? Anybody carry cash? Oh, some of you do. Say, like get in them jeans and grab your card. You know, I don't know. Jeans and greens sound a lot better though, right? Stay with me. It's so much greater. It's so much bigger than that. This is a major spiritual challenge to not have an ownership mentality on what God has given us, but to look at it as a gift from God. And I promise you, when you start to open your hands a bit more and live as if it's not your own, it's not yours, it's God's, we position ourselves for God to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine or ever ask for. He wants to give you all that he has. He wants to help you walk in freedom. So we're in this series called Holy Wind, Holy Fire, and we've been understanding and unlocking the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm looking at the uh, early church in Acts 2 and how they have positioned themselves and what's happened when they've done that, how God has worked uh, through that. And so far we've looked at, you know, when they were devoted to, you know, the apostles teach and they were devoted to scripture. They were devoted to fellowship and the breaking of bread. Like we need each other. It's not meant to be done alone. We need each other as encouragements. To be devoted to prayer. It's how we connect with God. I heard from Andrew last week about having all things in common. That we're bound together by Christ. 
Today, I want to look at how the early church lived with an open hand. How they said things like, it's not ours, it's God's. And then what happens when they did that? So picking up in verse 45 in Acts 2. You guys still here? All right. A little water break. And they would sell their property and possessions and share them with all to the extent that anyone had need. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And I love this. They, would, they did not have a tight grip. They weren't holding on to it. This is mine. It's not ours. It's God's. And whenever there was a need in the community, a genuine need, they would be willing to give up what they had to help the greater good. They elevated the community over just the individual. What it's not saying is that they sold everything they had and gave it away or gave up all their property. What it does say is they were willing to not have a tight hand, a tight grip on what God has given them. And when there was a need that came through, they were willing to do whatever was needed to be done to help each other out. Because it's not ours, it's God's. It's not ours, it's God's. And this is the outcome that happens from all of this. They, they, they found favor with all the people. People were coming from all around. What is going on here? What's happening in this community of people? There's something powerful happening. It's embracing. It's loving. It's generous. What is going on? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Numbers grew daily. People were being saved daily. And I want to tell you, the Greek word for salvation, for being saved, means freedom. People were learning how to be free. There was awe of signs and wonders happening. They were in constant awe. When they were willing to open their hand a little bit, it's not ours, it's God's. They positioned themselves for the Holy Spirit to move powerfully through them. Powerfully through them. Numbers grew on a daily basis. It's the life that happened from that. This is the bottom line. When we position ourselves, when we do that a little bit, when we are willing to come together and say, you know what, it's not ours, it's God's. We make room for God to do his work. And he can do more than we could ever imagine or ever ask for, church. Because he wants to give us all that he has. But the only way we're going to do that is to let go. It's not mine. It's God's. It's not ours. It's God's. There's two reasons why it's so hard. I have that ownership mentality in me. There's two reasons. It's, it's in us. It's there. The moment you come out of the womb, you have an ownership mentality. Parents, if you have kids, you recognize your kids want to fight. It's mine. It's mine. I got a little brother who's six and a half years younger than I am, and I, his name is um, Lucifer. <laughs> Man, as a kid, he was just, you know, I'm 12, he's six, it's just, he was just, oh, he was awful. Mine, it's mine, daddy took mine, he took mine. Well, now he's 40 years old, and they decided to have kids late in life. He has triplets who have just turned three years old. God is so good. God is so good. I was on a FaceTime call last week with them, and the kids are running around screaming, mine, mine, mine. And there's, there's Sean, straight faced, like, that's you, man. That was you. God is good. We all have it in us. It's there to want to hold on to it, to say it's mine, to say it's ours. It's not God's, it's mine but it's not ours, it's God's. And the other factor is, that really kind of enhances this, is that we live in a society that elevates the individual, that promotes the individual. 
We elevate the freedoms of the individual over the collective. We value uniqueness, independence, self-sufficiency, and autonomy. We celebrate and honor personal achievements, often assuming that success comes chiefly to those who wanted it more and worked harder than others. Personal relationships and the needs of friends and family trump the needs of strangers. See, the abilities and gifts that you've been given are not yours, they're from God. And people do them differently. Some work harder at them, and some work less at the gifts that they've been given. But don't for a minute think it's because of your own ability you have what you have. It's a gift from God. And the moment we think it's ours or our own doing, we become possessive. And we'll look at someone else and go, there's a reason why you're white, you know, the way you are. You didn't work hard enough. You didn't do this. It's not ours, church. It's God's. We can't forget that. I want to look at a story in Luke that I think has a deeper spiritual meaning than we think sometimes. And it's in Luke 18. It's Jesus and this young, rich ruler. And there's so much happening here. Uh, But just some really good stuff. I want to clarify in this. Verse 18 A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? But Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. And the young ruler said, Well, all these things I have kept since my youth. Now, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and give it the money and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? There's a lot going on here between this young ruler and Jesus. And from the surface of this, it seems like Jesus is just being cruel. He's being mean to this young rich ruler. Well, Jesus, I've kept the commandments since my youth. And Jesus is like, you have, have you? Well, go and do this. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. I mean, this young ruler, he's been going to church his whole life. He's been keeping the commands. He's an influencer. And he's coming to Jesus asking the right question. He's asking the right question. How do I inherit eternal life? I mean, what is Jesus doing with this young ruler? It seems cruel. It seems mean. It almost seems like he's condemning him to hell. That he's saying that people who have money have no chance to be in heaven someday. Let me say this right up front. Let me clear the air. This passage is not about heaven and hell. It's not about just keeping the commandments just to keep commandments. It's about finding God's life in this life. It's about learning to find the life that God wants to give us in this life. And the purpose of commandments, by the way, the commandments are spiritual. They are holy. They're given to us by God, but they're not meant just to be kept, to be kept. Don't, you didn't kill someone today? Oh, great, you're right with God. You didn't have an affair? Great, you're right with God. It's not about just keeping them. The commandments were always designed for us to find Christ in them meant for us to find life. Because what we're going to see in commandments is that we can't keep them ourselves. So we're going to find the need that we need for Jesus, his grace and his mercy. So commandments are good, but we can get kind of in a habit of just keeping commandments just to keep commandments. And we can miss the kingdom. We can miss Jesus by keeping commandments. So Jesus, he's not... He's not condemning this young man. He's trying to help him find life. He's trying to lead him into life. 
True life is staring this young man in the eyes and he can't see it because he is blinded by what he has. And Jesus is confronting him on that. There's something that you're holding on to tightly that you're elevating above me. You know, he asked the right question. How, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, in John 17, Jesus' long prayer, the first thing he says in the prayer is to know God is eternal life. That is present tense Greek. I mean, you can know God now. That means you can experience eternal life now. And Jesus is telling this guy, what's blocking you from receiving that life? Is there something that's bound up inside of you? There's something you're putting more trust in than God. But to experience eternal life now, we need to let go of this ownership mentality. Jesus is not punishing this young man. He's not being mean. He's trying to help him find life. To find a godly confidence. To learn to trust in God more. That no matter what happens, he can trust in who he says he is. And Jesus says, I will give you treasures in heaven. What I have to give you is worth more than any amount of money, the stuff that you have. But let's be honest, it's really hard to not hold on to what we have. See, this teaching is not about sell everything you have and give it away to the poor. It's not what it's about. It's about letting go of the ownership mentality that we have. It's not ours, it's God's. It's not ours, it's God's. And whenever we put something over God in our hearts, we got a problem. We have an ownership mentality. I mean, we live in a country that is so rich, right? I mean, there's varying degrees of wealth in our country, okay? And I'm not gonna try to be flippant about this, but I got someone in the family who is poor by this this country's standards. They have a house, they have an iPhone, they have a car, they have car insurance, they got health insurance, they got groceries, they go on vacations twice a year. And what happens when we have so much at our fingertips and we have so much abundance, we can find our security and our hope in that stuff. Money is not a bad thing. Having a house is not a, it's a gift from God. But the moment we think it's mine, and not his. We are blocking ourselves from receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. We're, receive, we're blocking ourselves from receiving all that God wants to give us. And he wants to give you life and life to the fullest. So much more he wants. You know, I said earlier that this is a, this is a sermon, it's not about money. And I really do mean that. Money can be one of those things that we hold on to tightly. But it's not just that. It can be our health. It can be our kids. We can hold on. You know, your kids aren't your own. They're God's, but he gives them to you as a gift to take care of, to nurture, to grow. Your stuff is not your own. And a big one in America is a problem is our time. We think time is ours and we're possessive. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. I want to do what I want to do. Time is not yours either. It's God's. Church, it's not ours. It's God's. And I want to tell you this. This again, I'm preaching to myself, to be honest with you. It is hard not to let go the things we have. It is easy to fall into the trap. I mean, the enemy wants to do that. He wants you to think you own everything that you have. Because when something happens to what God's given you, it can throw us all over the place. I don't like inflation. I filled up my Civic again. It was even more last time. I, it's like $54 to fill up my Civic. I don't like it. But I know who's in control still. I'm not going to lose my mind because I paid 55 bucks to pump my gas in my car. I don't like it. We don't have to like it. It's not ours. It's God's. Now, I know that saying that can sometimes kind of keep it up here in the abstract. Okay, God, Chad, okay, I understand. It's not ours. It's God's. 
I want to share a couple personal stories with you that can kind of bring it down to how this can kind of get played out. Because it's not just about the money. It's about health, relationships. I've shared this before with you. My personal walk, um, you know, I came to faith uh, when my wife and I separated. And I was a knucklehead and did some really stupid things. And you know, there was infidelity and she left and understandably so. And I came to faith I made a proclamation, I, made, I put a stake in the ground saying, Jesus, I don't know what it means to follow you, but I'm giving you all that I have. I wanna let go of my life and now let it become your life. Now the first couple of months, I'm not gonna lie to you, I was hoping that, I was trying to manipulate and show my wife what God's doing in my life, you know? Hey, look what God's doing to Chad now. Look what Chad's doing, I'm doing this now. I'm no longer that man anymore. And I kept trying to share and show my wife what God was doing in my life. It can sound like good intentions, but I was manipulating her. And then this old lady said, Chad, will you still follow Jesus with all you have if he doesn't bring your wife back? Whew. Sometimes we follow God because we want something to happen in our life. Will you still follow him with an open hand? Man, I tell you, it was hard to do that. But letting go of my wife, there was such freedom. There was such power. Letting go wasn't giving up. I still prayed. I still wanted her back. I still want our family together again. But I let go and I let God. Amen. I was trying to do what God has been trying to do the whole time. No, God, I got this. It's me. I got this. I own this. Let go. And when I let go, I mean the freedom, the empowerment, no longer bound. If my wife came back, wonderful. If she didn't, I was still going to be okay because God had a hold of me. He was not going to let go of me. And a few months later, God did bring my wife back. And our marriage today is better than it ever has been. You know, the life that follows by doing this. You see, the early church, when they positioned themselves for the spirit to move, there was so much life that followed. And it wasn't only my wife and I being restored and my family being restored. It's the impact that God had through us, through other couples who were struggling. Simply by letting go. Let go and let God. Second story I want to share with you. Make it really practical for you. Like I said, it's not just stuff. It can be a relationship. It can also be our health. Health. I had a buddy of mine. Oh, he's about a year older than I was. Um, three young girls. Found out he had terminal cancer. And he passed away at the age of 41, about six, seven years ago. And it's tragic and it's awful. Wouldn't wish it on anybody. But for three and a half years with the disease that he had, he walked with an open hand. He said, I am standing, I am praying for a miracle. I'm praying that God can heal me and I know he can, but I also know sometimes he won't but no matter what happens, I stand victorious already in Jesus. There's nothing that can separate me from Jesus, not even terminal cancer. And his life was hard. It was a hard three and a half years. He has three little ones. I want to tell you something. In the midst of death, there was so much life. The impact that God had to this one man willing to open his hand saying, it's not my life, it's yours. Rippled through communities. Seven years ago, it is still, the impact is still real today. Don't feel sorry for me is what he said. I already have victory. Letting go and let God because church, it's not ours, it's his. 
your money, your health, your relationships. And the more we can let go, the more freedom that God's gonna give us, the more of his life that he is going to give us. You guys still with me? I promise you this, that God has more he wants to give you than you could ever imagine and ever hope for. And I know this can be hard. I know this can be a struggle for, I know it is for me. But starting to let go and let God position ourselves to receive his power, his life, to walk in a godly confidence no matter what happens. You know, one of the things we do at Restoration that's really important, you heard Rainy talk about that during the announcement. We have, we put a lot of effort and resources in our local ministries, Restore and New Day and Victory Project and there's a Columbia trip coming up. Serving and loving on the underprivileged. We want to position ourselves to live with an open hand. It's not ours, it's God's. And when we have an ownership mentality, it's easy to look at someone who's homeless or someone struggling with addiction to make reasons and justify whether they're there because of poor choices in their life. That may or may not be true. But when you open your hands and you share a little bit of time with them, you sit down and have a meal with them, you get to know their story. They're no longer a statistic. They're no longer a number. They're one of ours. And when we learn to open our hand like those things, the spirit moves like a mighty wind. Not only through the people you're talking to, but in your own heart. Church, let's be willing to open her hand just a bit more. God's not condemning you. He's not criticizing you. He just wants to give you more of him. That's all he wants to do. So let's stop blocking that. That is how great our God is. I promise you God is greater than anything you have. I promise you that God is greater than anything that you're going through. I promise that God is greater and he has more that he wants to give you. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it because he is worthy of all praise. He is worthy of all glory. So Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. You alone are worthy of all praise. You alone are worthy of all glory. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for all that you give us. And we don't deserve it, but yet you still give it to us. And Lord, help us, empower us to learn how to open our hands and trust you with what you've given us. That it's not ours, it's yours. Or how great is our God. And Lord, you are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of all glory. Lord, amen, amen.